Hello, welcome back to No Code Week, brought to you by Startup Starter. We're a smart community for startups, investors, and service providers, a one-stop shop for entrepreneurship. Today, I have the pleasure of sitting down with the co-founder and co-CEO of a very special company that you guys, I'm sure, have seen all throughout the market in the last years make a lot of noise. They're helping people, everyday people, no coders, business owners, build products and bring them to life just through visual language. Um, without further ado, I want to bring to the stage Emmanuel Strashnov, co-founder and co-CEO of Bubble. Hey, Emmanuel. it's great to be here. Hey, how are you today? Very good. Yeah, where are you joining us from? From New York, actually. Oh, cool. How we haven't you? moved to the islands or anywhere. Yeah, well, yeah. Maybe, maybe at some point one is a little bit nicer when the time is coming. It's, it's nice to be home, whatever is going on. And, and New York is actually fine right now. Yeah, like actually, I've considered making the move. You know, like it feels lively and I hear that like now it's a good time to get a good, you know, rent. Yeah, for a good price. great deals. Yeah, okay, keep that in mind. Cool, well, very excited for you to join us. Bubble has been all over the place, really like hard to ignore in years to come, the last few years. Um, but there's also a big story behind it of how it came out to be in long years, right? Because I think a lot of the no-code companies started coming up in just in recent time. Yeah, so guys... we started in 2012, so it's been almost nine years now. Actually, more than nine years, if you think about the first line of code that was committed to the in GitHub for the Bubble project. So Yeah, we're, at the time, I think it wasn't called no-code, but were you guys pioneers in that space? We were pioneers in the recent wave uh, yeah. of that redefined a little bit what no code should be. Uh, it was not called no code at that point. The way we were framing our, it ourselves was visual programming. I think no code was coined by a, an investor in New York. Um, that said, uh, the reason I hesitated a little bit when you were asking whether we were pioneers is I think you know no code is basically at the root of what technology is about since the very beginning of technology. And people sure. have forgotten that a little bit because now there is a new space and it's cool, but and it's great. Don't get me wrong. But if you think, you know, what was Macintosh? What was Windows versus MS-DOS? It was a visual interface to replace a coding a command line, right? 
It's exactly what no code is. That's exactly what we do. Fair. Before MS DOS, you would type something to edit text, then Windows came, you double click, and you can do something, right? The, and and the, why, the reason why this is important is what we're trying to do now with Bubble and no code in general is actually something that many, many companies, including the most famous ones, Microsoft being the biggest name that comes to mind, have tried to do for decades. Like the idea of taking something that is impossible, difficult to do and requires code and turn that into something accessible and easy, that idea is not new at all. And that I think is the idea at the core of all the, at the history of uh, compu computing and personal computing in particular and like business computing. Uh, but of the recent era, yes, I would say we're one of the earlier ones. But wouldn't you say that if we look at kind of the timeline of when inventions come into play and how they influence right, kind of the rest of the world, that no code is one of those things that you can say, okay, well, now looking back on this last few years and even that movement, um, it will enable, right? It'll create just a boom. Also, the timing is just great with what happened last year, people being at home. You know, our thesis sort of started at every business now an in internet business, right? Yep. So, yeah, so I, th I think the, the main difference between what was going on in the 80s, 90s, and even 2010 and today is that the internet is everywhere. And so now it is actually viable to start a business from your literally from your bedroom with a Wi-Fi connection, which even like 15 years ago was not necessarily easy, uh, possible. And that is because, you know, even services we use, like Amazon Web Services, for instance, that gives you access to servers. Now, I've never seen a server in my life, and I hope I will never see one because, you know, I trust Amazon to deal with that. And yeah. what we're adding on top of that is the same thing, enabling people to start companies without, you know, looking at code is what we offer. But what I mean is, for no code to really explode and for the creator economy to start embracing it as a creation tool, we had to have the infrastructure in place to be able to do that in a purely remote way and outsourcing a lot of the layers of the stack. And uh, it took some time. That's why, that's, that's why I mean, th there is a reason why it started taking off in 2019. Fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. Um, and now let's kind of get to the story. We really want to hear this clip of an interesting one, right? You were born in France, came to the US, you were a management consultant beforehand. So it's kind of a long story. Can you tell us a bit about you know your background and how you came here? Yeah, uh, I, I never thought I would be a software um, entrepreneur, actually. So it kind of happened randomly. Um, I was very French, actually. Uh, and so as a very French person, I, was one, I always wanted to work for the government. And effectively, that's what I did. Uh, I went to the right schools in France to be working for the government. Um, that said, I already had something for, first of all, mathematics, which is a very uh, traditional track in France. And, uh, and I had something for uh, coding because I grew up in the countryside where I didn't have that much to do except doing things like learning how to code. Sure. That, that was very different technologies. It was under MS-DOS, you know, quick basis, this kind of thing. That was like 25, 26 years ago. But, you know, at the end of the day, it hasn't changed, which is precisely, by the way, why Bubble needs to exist. You know? <laughs> it needs to change. Like, come right. on. We can't be building things the same way I was doing that when I was a teenager. Sure, sure. And, um, and so after school, I uh, was about to join the government. And then I decided that I wanted to see the world a little bit and having an interest in China from my parents. My parents had both uh, lived in China before and met in Beijing. I wanted to spend a few years in China. And so that was my consulting experience there. Got it. The, the, the deal was that I was supposed to go back to the government after that. I was just delaying my entry to the government. And then that's, I would say that's kind of things when things started going off track and wrong because it was not, I didn't follow that plan. After three years there, I started feeling that the government might not be exciting enough and I wanted something a little bit more fast paced, you know, to change. So that led me, and I wanted to discover the US to which I had like very little exposure so far. And so I applied to business school. I got into Harvard for my MBA. And that's uh, what at Harvard that slowly actually kind of came naturally that entrepreneurship became obvious, like it became obvious to me it was the right uh, path for me. But it's something that happened very slowly and subtly. And then uh, the actual partnership with Josh and Bubble kind of happened completely randomly because it was on our first, um, we decided to partner on our first coffee meeting. So that's a pretty special thing. Well, but I would say the evolution to entrepreneurship felt natural. The opportunity itself wasn't expected. And what was it like? I've had a few friends that are management consultants that once they transition, it's like, well, you're used to like theoretical and like kind of doing homework in a way, right? But then when it's time to actually kind of start getting started, you realize like, well, a lot of things that I knew, the assumptions that I made, now I cannot, don't really transfer the same. 
you come from a different school of thought. What was that like for you? So I think the fact that I was in consulting in China made my consulting experience very different and prepared me much better to managing the chaos that uh, and the ambiguity that entrepreneurship brings to you. Sure. Um, so my experience in consulting was a bit special because I worked at a firm, like it's one of the major international firms, but turns out the partnership they had in China was very um, Chinese. So it was all mainland Chinese uh, partners. And so all the clients were Chinese companies. And so, and at the same time, I was there when the Lehman Brothers crisis hit in 20, 2008. And so all international firms were basically cutting their consulting budgets. So I was basically thrown on Chinese projects for Chinese companies in Chinese. <laughs> and my Mandarin was decent, it still is decent, you know, like I can communicate, but I certainly wouldn't pretend that I had like a very, um, a very strong uh, business to the Mandarin. And so since the beginning of my work, I had to show, you know, do the homework that you do as a consultant, you know, doing all the slides and everything, but always doing them with a the feeling that I was never hundred percent sure that I was doing right, what I was doing right, or what I was even understanding the context and what I was asked to do right. Because I, I wouldn't pretend my Chinese was like, okay, I understand every single thing I hear. Um, turns out most of the time I was mostly right. And so it was okay, but being, forced to deal with this ambiguity uh, constantly is actually something that turned out to be very valuable uh, fast forward four years later when I was on Bubble because as, even though I did some programming as a kid, I went very far from technology for many, many years. And when I started working with Josh, it was clearly identified that Josh would be the technical my, uh, person of the company, I would, I would be the business person. And pretty quickly, it turned out that there was no room for a business person until our product was good enough. And so sure. I had to start coding again. And so I was thrown in that code base that Josh had started working on, yeah. where it, it, I could almost make the joke, it looked like Chinese to be at first, you know, like a very foreign language, and I had to grow in it and everything. And that turned out to be a very useful skill. Sure. I'm just risk taking, I was kind of just jumping into it. Hmm. I'm fair. I think. I've had a few friends that kind of go through the same story that, like, hey, we're starting something and now like I'll be the COO and I'll just do operations, but it's three of us. There's real no need for operations. We need to really work on building something first. So I hear you. Okay. So then you leave China, you come to the US, you go to Harvard, congrats. You get out and did you start working somewhere? Or was it just bubble immediately kind of the idea came? What was that like? So I was looking for a job uh, after school. I mean, I interned in fashion over the summer. so. I did a little bit of a stunt there for a few, a few weeks. And then I went back to school for my second year and graduated uh, in May. Didn't line up a job at that point because um, I didn't, didn't feel I was mature enough in my like soul searching process to find the right job after school. And so I waited long enough. Uh, and so at that point, I started being more clear that I wanted to be working on some technical product in software. Never thought that would be technical, so I was gonna get like business development jobs and stuff like this. And um, I actually had found like a BD role at a pretty cool startup in New York that, that I was very happy about. And the day before uh, I had to give a response to that job, uh, to that company, um, I eventually ended up having coffee with Josh with whom I had been introduced like a couple of weeks prior to this, but I was not in New York at that point. And back then it was not fashionable to talk too much on Skype, you know, like people were expecting to meet in person. Sure. Uh, it was like the old world, right? Yeah. Um, and so I met him at this coffee shop who is telling him, great to meet, but I have my um, a job offer that is expiring tomorrow. I'm going to take it. Um, it's actually taking care of my immigration situation, which if we are foreigners in the audience, it's something always pretty stressful for uh, non-citizens sure. or non-permanent resident. Um, and we talked and we talked and we talked and for probably almost like three hours. And at the end, it was like, well, do you want to give it a shot? And, uh, and I said, yes. So I didn't say yes immediately. I wanted to check a few things. I wanted to check, am I really going to do something crazy in terms of immigration? Because at some point there are like hard rules you have to abide by. Yeah. Um, so I asked advice to some people and turned out they told me there was a, there were, was a way and there, there indeed was a way. I, mean, I'm, I managed to stay and I started working on Bubble with them. It was not called Bubble at that point. So it took a little bit of time to come up with a name. And what was the meeting like? What was the coffee like? What were you guys talking about? Just like, let's discuss ideas, see if we can come up with something. So it was already his idea, actually. He already had started working on this. Um, it was very early on, and he had an early prototype. So we talked about that, but then quickly we started talking about different things. Uh, like um, he was a philosophy major from college. I used to write 
even though I went to a math uh, school, I used to write some philosophy myself in French. So we we're discussing that, so discussing like random things, like kind of the conversation went in different directions. Yeah. Honestly, I don't remember, you know, it was like nine years ago, but I would say probably only 30 or 40% of the chat was about what ended up becoming bubble and the rest was things, you know. Yeah, so you guess but, and, and that's kind of what you want, right? You don't want a purely professional brainstorming session. Of course. Because yeah. if, if you think about it, you, we didn't know each other at all. Like we could have been highly non-compatible. Mm -hmm. And you know, no. No, nine years later, all. here we are. So. No. Cool, okay. Then you guys have a meeting, you decide, okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna join this guy that's got a interesting product. And the idea was already that we're going to bring like visual language programming. Was that what it was starting? Yeah, the, the idea is that we would enable non-technical founders to start companies on their own. So okay. you, you have to put that back in the context of 2012, where it was the beginning of the startup era, where you know people wanted to build marketplaces for everything. People started realizing the potential of moving a lot of interactions to the web. You know whether it's you know uh, social networks, or like you know people meet designers gathering and finding designers um, and pro product management designers is kind of like gathering or marketplaces like Airbnb type platforms. And so everybody was looking for a software engineer, you know, like especially in New York. And we, we just felt like a lot of the ideas that these people were trying to build were actually not truly innovative from a technical standpoint. Hmm. You know, at the end of the day, if you start uploading pictures of people on Airbnb, like it's become a geolocation dating website, you know, you can see people see their picture match, uh, not match, that's a feature that's missing, but send messages and everything. So we felt like there is something wrong there. Like engineers are in very, very short supply. They paid extreme amounts of money. Back then it was true, even more true today, to do something that is actually not truly value adding for most of the startups out there. Now, you, you have some companies like, like Bubble or some others that do much more like sophisticated things where the value they're creating is through the code they write. But I would argue that uh, something like Airbnb, the value they create is not through the code they write. It's more through their marketing approach, like creating a community of owners of houses and like, you know, uh, people that want to rent them. Um, and so that, that was uh, the initial idea. Over time, that has evolved a little bit with you know, empowering people to build things without code. But I would say not using code to build things was more of a mean than an end for us. It was more, sure. that's the way we're going to empower people to do things. If it had turned out that letting them writing simple code was a better way, maybe we would have gone that route. In fact, a lot of people have in the past uh, tried, tried to make the coding process easier with easier code. What we're seeing now and what we've said at Bubble for a long time is that it's just not good enough and so it's, it can't work. But uh, but a lot of people gave it a shot. Got it. And there was no fear like, okay, it's the real validation people want to do this because it's, you know, you're entering something new where the norm is, well, I'm going to have software engineers doing this, right? No, like, um, you know, this is certainly probably the worst way to start a company, but we've never ever done any kind of like market validation, market sizing, testing whether people would want to use what we built because what we felt was, look, finding an engineer is difficult. Writing code sucks. It takes a long time. It can bugs. It's like not fun to look at the dark screen with a lot of code. If we can make that process easier, well, of course it's going to work. Sure. Like, you know, like how can it not work, right? So the question was like, it's not, are people going to want this? The people was, are we going to be able to create a product that is good enough for people to actually want to use it? And so instead of losing time, because I really think it would have been a waste of time, talking to people to validate whether they wanted to use something like Bubble, we decided, well, the only way to know whether it works is to actually uh, build it and be heads down on the product. And that's what we, that's what we did. And that's how uh, we ended just being the two of us for five years, you know, heads five down years. on the product. So you, got, you had to learn how to code and kind of get back into it to make it I go, I go back into it, yeah. Okay. And then, a tough but good teacher. But you guys bootstrap, right? Uh, I mean, for uh, till 2019, yes. Okay, so then on the 2019, so for the five years that you guys were getting started, it so it was, was seven years actually. Se seven. Well, so many years, right? So seven years, right? Um, how do you guys live? What did you did you kind of put a, an early version out and say, hey, here it is, try it out? We mostly use our savings, honestly, uh, at first for the first like two years and a half or something. Um, and then we found a few customers that were paying us. You know, I took a salary earlier than Josh because I had to for legal reasons. Like uh, 
not to get too technical, but there is something called a prevailing wage with your H1, uh, with the visa you're having. So I took a salary earlier and then, you know, we fixed that uh, between the two of us later uh, once we started making more money as a company. But yeah, um, it was mostly our savings, cheap lifestyle. Looking back, it was, um, I kind of, it toward the end, I'm not going to lie, like I started being in a situation, in a place where I wanted a little bit more comfort with me, you know, I, I was like 33 or 32 and living with three roommates. And, I, you know, I started being to the point where I think I worked hard enough in my life. I'd like to enjoy an apartment for myself. Yeah. But the first two years of this, um, two, three years, were actually quite enjoyable. Like the frugal lifestyle that was imposed because of that made me feel very connected to the mission that I was setting for myself with the product, uh, with that. And, um, it helped me confirm how fundamentally excited I was about solving that problem and passionate I was about this and that I wasn't there for the money. And in fact, I'm really not there for the money. I mean, obviously, if the company works well, there will be uh, wealth created because it's the internet and this business is like that scale. But it really was not the point when we started. Sure. Okay. So why you guys didn't consider racing? I mean, you guys have a good product, something really new. And now you kind of had the age saying, okay, well, I do, you know, I've, I've been a management consultant, I've made good money, I've, I've got an MBA from Harvard, I could have different this in life, and you know how to speak the business. Why didn't you guys fundraise early on? Because um, there are a couple of reasons. Um, there is like business reasons and then the true reason, I guess. The, 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 the business reason was we didn't feel that we were a business that could have explosive growth for quite some time because the product needs to be good enough for people to even want to look at it. You know, it takes a very long time to, first of all, create a product that's powerful enough to create something sophisticated without code. I mean, it's a hard problem, you know, like Microsoft has tried for decades and they still don't have something satisfactory, right? And it's not that they're short on resources. Mm. Then you need to convince people it's worth their time. Then you need to uh, teach them and train them and going to lose some people on the way and your documentation is going to not be good at first, right? Then they need to build something. And after that, that once they build some things they show it to their friends, then maybe you can have someone else start that is coming from a friend, right? So it's a very slow process. You could argue that having money speed that up. There are limits to that. And if it were true, then, you know, again, Microsoft would just put a billion dollars on the problem and would have crushed us a long time ago and it hasn't started yet. Or maybe it has, but I'm not aware of it. <laughs> uh, like it's certainly not at uh, uh, where we are in terms of product. So we felt that we were not able to deliver fast growth. And so it would be fairly dangerous to, um, to fundraise because as soon as you fundraise, you know, the clock starts ticking. And sure. At that point, I didn't have a ton of experience in the VC world, but I already started seeing that mechanism happen. And what we saw is uh, some companies that nobody would know now that were started a year after us went through the VC route, like traditional VC route. They both did Y Combinator. One of the companies raised from Andreessen and Horowitz, you know, the best names of the value you can think of, sure. ended up going out of business. And I don't, wow. you know, I'm not an insider store uh, in these stories, but I'm pretty sure the fact that they fundraised put some pressure in the wrong place in the earlier, early on. So that was a business reason. And then the real reason I would say is, uh, I think there was a little bit of a, some irreverence from Josh and I that just didn't want to take, having people telling us what to do. I get I it. Enjoy yeah. that. Uh, and so not fundraising was kind of cool. No, I get it. I think that's, that's something to consider, right? Because we go through the same a lot. So, hey, do we fundraise? Do we not? Do we keep it? Do we keep the company? Do we like kind of having freedom, right? And no. I, and, and the last thing I'd say is that um, we we haven't met people that were truly excited about what we were doing back then. You know, we did not actively fundraise, but you know, through my business school network, when Josh has in those friends, his own friends that were like pretty well connected with the valley, we did have conversations from time to time. And maybe we were telling what we were doing terribly, but if that's the case, uh, then what I'm doing now is a terrible job because it's exactly the same thing that I'm saying now, really. My speech has not really changed over the years. And people were, people, you know, now investors find that exciting today. But back in 2012, you know, they were not excited about like this. Do you guys do any accelerators or any kind of help or was just you two guys? Just no, just us excited. two guys. Yeah. Wow. Five years. What was that journey like? So, like, what was it like? Okay, kind of getting. So it was five years, the two of us. Right, then right. We built, then we built a team, but bootstrapped. 
which got us to like 12 people. And then we pulled the trigger on the round two years ago. Got it. Okay. So then at kind of like a which point did you feel, okay, you know, this is something people want. Now we get validation. I've gone long enough and people are actually getting this. We should definitely stick to this and grow it. But was it just always mission driven? We're going to make it work no matter what. Or was well, it, it was always mission driven. That said, I think it's around 2018 when we started feeling that the product was actually pretty strong and ready, like not perfect still today. You know, there's still always a lot of things to fix, but now we start having something where, you know, when we make the claim, you can build Twitter without code. We actually can deliver on that. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's not true for a lot of players, actually. A lot of players vastly exaggerate what you can do with their product. And um, then we were like, okay, now we can grow faster. We didn't put the, uh, the trigger on fundraising right away because, well, you know, at that point we had started hiring people and you know, you're busy and you only have 24 hours a day. So it took probably another yeah. six months after that to be like, okay, now let's think about fundraising. Then another like two, three months to plan the process. The, the fundraising process though, we were lucky because it went pretty quickly. Yeah. And what was that judgment like where you kind of picking companies that fail, you know, that were kind of close to your heart that you say, these guys align with me? Was it more like this is the right opportunity? These guys can have the right setup for us. It's always a tricky process picking at the right VC. It is. We were fortunate to have uh, enough term sheets to do a lot of interviewing. So we talked to a lot of people. Um, we did a ton of reference calls. Uh, like we called other founders. Obviously, we went for people who believed in what we were doing. But I would say the filter is done early on that one. Like if people don't believe in what you're doing, you're not going to get a term sheet most sure. of the time. So we ended up with three firms that were interested in talking, uh, like working with us like actively being investing in us uh i would say all of them were i think quite aligned on the align on the mission but then we talked with uh firms i mean and th to be fair we got very positive reviews for all the firms i mean I, I think at a certain level all the firms are pretty good marginally we had better vibes with signal fire and so we with them and was it you interviewing with them kind of taking the stance of like hey i have the price or did they flip it and you kind of had to convince them my my company is good you guys should invest i mean it starts more as you have to convince them your company is worth it right because you have more companies pitching than five vc firms that said at some point once they start being interested and more importantly once a second firm start being interesting then it flips and then they are you are the one they are the one pitching you it's it's a pretty natural evolution Cool. Gotcha. Okay. Then now you guys have a company, you guys are hiring the, the five year segment of kind of you guys to build them, which is insane, by the way, uh, has yeah. passed. What was the first hire? Who was the first person you guys said, okay, we need help now? Uh, it was uh, engineers. Okay. Okay. I and mean, then, pretty traditionally. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And then following that up when you said, okay, once you kind of guys hit 12, now it feels like it's a company, right? From that moment, kind of what did it go? <laughs> yeah. From then on, what was that like? Where does it go? Because now you're okay, let's just hire more people. Let's get this going. Let's get this rocket ship, you know, but you're kind of losing grip of that close knit that you had that is just you two guys. No, I mean, we only like a little bit less than 40 people now. It's still pretty close. Um, I mean, yeah, for 40 people, they suddenly, especially as founders, at 12 people, we used to interact with everyone. Now, you know, with 40 people, it's a bit tougher, but I would argue it's more of a COVID thing than, um, than a scale thing, honestly. Like it's just being all remote is a little bit tougher. Uh, but that said, I mean, I'm pretty sure when you have 200 people, it's going to be very. I will look back at 40, seeing like, wow, good old times. So. Yeah, and, and at this rate, when do you guys feel like it's 200? Are you guys going to continue now raising or? We'll continue? see. Um, probably, I would say. I think now we are. I think the kind of business that if money is used wisely. Mm money can accelerate growth tremendously in a very positive way, which again, I don't think was the case eight years ago. Um, and so given how much resources there are in the market, I mean, to be practically clear, like how much cash there is in the market, I think we can probably find, find ways to use some uh, in a good way that just benefits the mission better. Sure. I think, well, even, even man, like I, I didn't come from like no code. I didn't see no code. I was just building a company. I needed help and I just found tools that I needed. But bubble was just something that was just always there that I just couldn't ignore. That even if I didn't know what it was, 
it was just kind of coming. Oh, you have to use this. I think that was one of one of our first like partners was getting Bubble, without even knowing what it was. Uh, so it's just to talk, you know, like hey, it's, it's coming out there. I think it's hard to ignore these days. And now with what's going on, people trying to start companies. It's just you guys are so well positioned for the future to come. Yep, I um, hope so. Yeah, so do I. Cool. Okay, then what are some of the lessons that you would say were really something you learned along the way that kind of shaped you to be who you are today and kind of take the company to where it is right now? Well, there are a lot of questions here. Um, Let's focus on like, okay, what's one lesson that you would say, man, like there's one thing I can really teach to people that I would like that I taught me a lot, but in this journey of entrepreneurship, which is what bubbles are like, that would really help others. I guess one lesson will be whatever you're trying to do as an entrepreneur is going to be harder than you think. Yeah, 100%. And, and it's okay, but be prepared. Um, it's going to be harder and longer, uh, which I mean, and, and I think we, we're doing very well. You know, I, I'm very happy where we are today, and, but it's been nine years. You know, it's been a very long time. And when we, you look at other people in our space, some of them got bigger with like later, uh, like larger financing rounds lately. But when you look at how how big they are, actually, it's still pretty small compared to Uber, who, which was started the same year as we were. And Uber was hard for other reasons. My point being, building something like a product, a complex tool like Bubble, is a difficult endeavor and takes a very long time. And that I did not necessarily expect that at first. Like I wouldn't say, uh, I, I guess I guess I did underestimate how hard it was. And you know that that's one of the lessons. Um, and then I, I could get um, from an entrepreneurial level, uh, which is kind of related, like one lesson I figured for us, um, which is not obvious and a little bit contrary to what a lot of people say. And I want to preface by saying that because it's not necessarily something that would apply to every business out there. But I would urge people not to launch too soon. Like okay. people say, you know, you should launch your business as soon as possible and get it live to get feedback. I think that's the important part, get feedback. Sure. So for, for us, for instance, um, we had our first paying customers and they even paid us by check because at that time we didn't have like the implementation to take credit cards to Stripe um, in December 2012. So as super early and at that time, the product was, you have no idea how ugly that was uh, and how limited it was. And, um, and so we had feedback extremely early with engaged users that were using us seriously and paying. But I would consider our first public launch in uh, September or October 2015. So fairly late, actually, on Product Hunt. And I think it turned out to be a good thing for us because we could make actually the best of the opportunity. And that's what really put us on the map. And today we, we're here today because of that launch in October 2015. I mean, not only, but it certainly helped a ton. Uh, and, and I often see people starting companies uh, launching too soon at a time where they can't get as much value from the launch as they can, as they could have. Sure. So my, my advice is to wait a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Now I want to kind of focus on, on product. How does Emmanuel Strachanov see the world? What do you think in like five years, 10 years from now, knowing what you know, and you know, you're just so immersed in this, do you foresee now kind of like a shift coming and like, Hey, we're not going, we're going to stop hiring just normal software engineers, maybe still kind of have some like data scientists and AI driven, but you're going to see more like a focus of like, Hey, just, simple no coding tools just visual language stuff What's i think yeah I, I think more and more the world is going to turn into uh like the development world like here sure. let's be specific right i don't want to start thinking about you know <laughs> i mean i can but my opinions may not be as relevant um the, the development software development world i think we're going to start you know seeing hardcore engineers and no coders or in bubble you call them bubblers start forming a blend a little bit. And it's going to be a little bit more and more unclear who's actually writing code and who's not writing code. And they work together on some projects. Um, and so what, what I hope that means in practice is that five to 10 years from now, every company that needs to build something will start, will assess how to build that, looking at you know the different tools that exist. And that probably for 80% of the needs, we'll stick to a no-code tool, which at that point should not be called no-code. It's just going to be the way to build, you know, yeah. that's a tool. Yeah. And if they need to extend the platform and add some features, or if there is something that Bubble hopefully is not the best at, then they will bring engineers on board to code that, uh, to uh, extend the platform with some code. So engineers are not going to go away. Companies will still hire engineers, 
just much less of them. And what's tr truly exciting about this is that then engineers will only start working on new problems. One of the biggest tragedies today, honestly, and when I mean tragedy, I actually mean it because we don't know what they could do if they have time. But when you see there's so much money today going in startups that look together, uh, looked like each other a ton from a technical standpoint, like look at Lyft and Uber, mm. amazing companies, but what the difference between the two technically, right? One is pink, the other one is black, but yeah. at the end of the day, it's fundamentally the same product, right? And they have thousands of engineers. What at a time where the need for software could improve things in any field, really, not just like consumer tech, right? It, healthcare, environment is, totally shows like better code could do so much good things if used mm -hmm. wisely. And we see most of the smart, uh, um, capable talent being focused on consumer tech because that's where the money is or like enterprise tech makes me very sad. I think it's just a waste of resource allocation. Like it's just wrong and it, it goes into solving problems that are not necessarily the most important problem, important problems to solve. And so what I'm hoping what that gets us 10 years from now, sooner than that, hopefully five years from now is in enterprise companies like Lyft and Uber or like any of these will stop using that many engineers because they're not necessary anymore. They'll use something like Bubble. They'll have a few engineers because you might want to write a better algorithm than your competitor to match riders and drivers, for instance, you know. But then the, all these engineers that will be not working on these companies can finally work on like truly innovative problems. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I mean, some still do at these companies, but there is a lot of reinventing the wheel going on currently at those sure. companies because there's, uh, there is a need in the market. And so there is no alternative to build things. Well, it turns out that there is one uh, and it's just about us to make it bigger. Uh, but when you think about the impact of no code, people think, you know, we empowering you know creators to create more things, hundred percent, and that's highly exciting and really something I want to keep pushing. But there is a secondary effect that might even be more important, which is we're going to free engineering time to actually work on real problems. And I found that particularly ex exciting. Okay, for sure. A few questions that came from this. Um, one, really brief: Can an Airbnb, Uber, Lyft be built on Bubble right now? Yes. Um, so, and I'll, I'm not a bullshitter. So I, you know, we don't put things on our website. Like, I actually think one of the most important things that I can do as a founder of a company like Bubble that lets people create things is to be very clear and upfront about what you can do and can't do, because people will find out if you lie, and then you reinforce the skepticism that even though no code is cool today, and you know, you guys are doing no code week, and there are other events happening there is still a lot of skepticism from the tech technical world about mm -hmm. technologies like this. Um, so very, yes, feature wise, as long as we're talking as a website, you know, web platform. So Uber, it's a little bit harder because it's native and it's not something we do. So I'll focus on Airbnb.com, right? Yeah. Functionality wise, yes, there is very little that Bubble can do today, including, you know, customizing prices to some circumstances that might require a like, little bit of code. So today I, can, I can't think of many things that Bubble can do where I'm not going to say yes, and I want to be explicit, is a scale. Like yeah. if, if you were to have overnight a company as big as Airbnb on Bubble today, you, the servers would probably crash. Now, the good news is that it's unlikely to happen. And that's something that there's no point for us to build for Airbnb scale when our users are not Airbnb yet, right? So this is something we work over time to just make sure we scale nicely with our users. Um, but at, what, What's exciting though, and honestly revolutionary, like no other team in the world has achieved that so far. And that's something I'm extremely proud of what we're doing at Bubble is we've pushed the limits of what you can do without code further than any other team. And we can make the claim that you can build Airbnb functionality wise without code. Um, and there's no other tool on the market that will let you do that. I feel this something like this will just explode in the emerging markets. Like I'm in Colombia, right? That's one of the things where- We're very- we're very high on, um, usually we don't share, you know, too much of revenue numbers, but that one I can share that let only 40% of our revenue is from the US. Okay. Right. Which, so, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know other startups numbers, but from what I'm hearing is definitely much higher. So Brazil is a very strong country for us. There is a very active community. India is very active. I think we have users in more like 120 or 30 countries, uh, now. So the, yeah, the, and the, the reason is, 
emerging markets have uh, don't necessarily have the infrastructure to train engineers. Sure. And so it's actually an even bigger problem there, like the shortage of engineers. Strangely enough, is a bigger problem in Africa than it is um, in Silicon Valley. And so, yes, uh, there's definitely something to do in emerging markets. Got it. Okay. And now another question. I'm learning so much from you. Do you guys foresee then kind of taking the route of, hey, I want to take Bubble as far as like in the future, right? SpaceX can build on Bubble, right? And kind of going in a complexity route that, like, hey, we're going to make it more and more rich. Um, or more like, hey, can we focus on the bigger markets, consumer led, just the easy stuff that people are going to be able to use, or just both? I mean, of course, you want to say both, but in practice, you kind of have to choose a focus. Okay. And, and to that question, then our, our response is fairly clear. Um, we don't necessarily want to add complexity. I don't think we need to, but we want to make sure we create a product that can scale and that people can keep using to become the next Airbnb. That doesn't mean we won't do things to make the product easier to learn. And we have a couple of projects going on right now to make that happen. But I feel like we're at the point now where we reach a certain sweet spot. Bubble is certainly not the easiest product to learn, but we've proven with enough thousands of people that if people are motivated, they can learn. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there are two ways to solve that. Certainly we can improve things to make it easier to use and learn. Actually, I wouldn't say easier to use. I think the feedback we're getting from our experienced users is once you know how to use, it's actually fairly easy. You don't, meaning you don't need to click in too many places. Like it's actually pretty efficient as an interface. Like you can do a lot with very few clicks, but you need to know how to use it. And, um, and so then the question is, can we make it easier to learn? So there's certainly a ton of stuff we can do to make it easy to learn on the product, on the documentation, but there is also uh, evangelization part to this. If you know people actually trusted me when I say, and the problem is that if I say it, people may not believe me. So it's even better when users say it. If people trusted me when I say, hey, it's gonna take you 10 hours or 20 hours or 30 hours of learning, but then you're gonna have the same powers as a software engineer, then people will just go through it because 30 hours is nothing. Sure. It is a lot if you're not sure what you're going to do with it. Yeah, I don't have 30 hours to spend, but you have to compare that not with what you could do in one hour and play. You have to compare that with spending, you know, four or five years of computer science training, right? And if you put that in that regard, it's nothing. So that's why investing in making sure we have success stories on our platform is so important because if we get the next billion dollar company that goes public and it's a bubble pirate startup, then, um, then suddenly, you know, everybody will know that, wow, can, shit, this guy, yeah. built like a, he doesn't have engineers and he built like a billion dollar startup, really? And then suddenly we won't have any problem and people won't say bubble is too hard to learn, you know? So it's a lot of a reputation issue. So that's why I think it's much more promising to work that way instead of trying to simplify the product to the point where you can't do too much. Because the other thing I will say is, sorry, but there's no free lunch, you know? Like if you want freedom to create anything you want, the product at some point will be, you will be making mistakes because it's open-ended and you will have to fix your mistakes and you might get frustrated. And that's where, you know, the learning curve can be painful at times. The learning curve, the problem with the learning curve is not that you have to watch videos, right? People complain about the learning curve because they can't figure out what they did wrong and then to go back and, right? Th that, unfortunately, will do whatever we can to shorten that learning curve. Yeah. But again, there's no free lunch. If you want open-endedness, if you want to be able to do whatever you want on the web, you're going to have to learn the tool. Sure. Cool. We have a question from our community. Do you consider Bubble to be a community-first-led company? Yeah. Uh, I mean, community-first, it's, it's very community-driven. First, I don't know, like, because it started with a product. So some people would say we're product first, community first. I mean, at the end of the day, we're a product before being a community. But the community is extremely important to us, yes. Gotcha. It was almost like um, it's a little bit um, a consequence of our bootstrapping history where so for five years it was just the two of us. I was the one in charge of building the product while Josh was building our infrastructure. Um, and in addition to that, I had to deal with uh, customer success. So I was like receiving all the incoming uh, com bug reports, complaints and everything. And, uh, and at some point it was just becoming non-manageable. And so I started a community for people to help each other. And so that's the forum that we still have today. You know, if, we go, if you go to forum.bubble.io, that's something that I started in June, 2015. 
Um, and then, so th then there kind of was like a, some kind of a contract, you know, with the community was, I'm not going to answer your emails that much. Like as a company, we're not going to answer your emails, but you guys help each other, experience bubblers, help the new one. The new one don't expect us to send, be, you know, have a support team that can email you within two hours. But yeah. on the flip side, in return, we're going to keep heads down on the product and build a great product. And if you uh, if you guys hit some dead ends that are really getting in your way, we figure out a way to remove them. And so that's how we started. And still today, it's still very much the spirit. Um, and that has turned out to be a very valuable asset for the company. Gotcha. There's one thing I forgot to ask. Didn't come to mind as you were saying it. But once you started selling and like letting people use Bubble, what kind of business, what kind of projects are people building with this? What was it the first thing that you saw? Like the first customer that went and built something, what did they build? The, the very first customer that paid us, that sent us a check was um, like this check I mentioned. I actually have a picture of the check. Yeah. We, ca we cashed it in though, because at that time I certainly wanted to cash it in. Um, they were building like a financial literacy uh, platform. So it was a platform where people could share tips, advice, and lessons about how to manage your personal finances. Okay. And a lot of videos, so it was deeply integrated with YouTube, where people would upload to YouTube. So I, I guess today it would not necessarily make sense anymore because I think a YouTube channel might be enough. But back then in 2012, you didn't have YouTube channels. So it was something on top of YouTube, basically, but as a web app and people could comment. So a very simple web app, web app you know, but uh, something that would require engineers to build. Gotcha. And are there any customers now today that you're like really proud of, like looking like, man, this is really exciting what they're building on Bubble? Do you guys keep track of? I mean, honestly, it's going to sound cheesy, but I can't say all of them, but many, many of them. You know, like yeah. uh, we've seen people doing extremely successful things on us. Um, some of them being successful, like kind of the type A traditional entrepreneur, raising money, scaling quickly. Uh, like we have a company in Paris currently doing more than 4 million euros of AR. On bubble for instance and they're planning to double this year so we've seen these kind of situations we also have um and then we have people who do non-profit work that is actually very something to be very proud of you know like people that use their bubble skill to create software in places where software would never be used because it's just too expensive and there's no market to address like someone when, once um which talked to me like a few months ago didn't know i was french he wrote in english but it turns out he was french uh, telling me that he used Bubble to build a portal for pregnant women who were single and needed help to deal with their pregnancy because of COVID, they couldn't do the gatherings anymore. How cool is that? You know, like yeah. that we never make a dime. You know, that thing would never make money. But that's really what yeah. Bubble is about. You know, Bubble is about you know making sure that when there is an opportunity to improve the situation with technology, whether it's for free or you know uh, on a nonprofit basis, they can. And uh, and I think it's one of the coolest things you can. Imagine as a founder, you know, getting emails like this. Yeah, and have you seen anything where you're like, man, these guys are really pushing the boundaries of what Bubble can yeah. do? Yeah, less today, I think, because now we've added enough features, but in the early year, or oh, maybe I don't see them anymore because I think we have like, you know, close to a million apps now, so it's, it's, wow. it's a lot. But, but uh, a few years ago, especially when I was doing success myself, it would happen sometimes that I was like, wow, how did this guy, is that a Bubble app? And I had to actually look at the console to make sure it was one. Mm. Cool. Well, I think we're reaching out there at the end of the time. Any parting words, wishes, any last advice you want to give it out there to our members and to your community those are watching? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. I mean, uh, it's sure. always great to be able to talk to um, to the community. It's something that as the company, as it gets bigger, we lose that a little bit naturally, you know? And so I'm always very uh, fond of opportunities like this to, uh, to be able to, to talk with the community. I, I want to thank everyone for their support. Um, I don't know if Bubble is a community first company uh, or not, but what, what I'm sure is that, you know, we wouldn't be here without the community of people who are either telling their friends about it because it's, if, again, if I say, if I make a speech here and you will all say, I know he's just selling his thing. If you, you tell to your friend, I build that and believe me, it works hundred percent that will convert and hundred percent, you know, you will convert that person to this, uh, to the no good movement and Bubble in particular. So I want to thank everyone on that. And um, yeah, uh, we have exciting things coming up for everyone. So I'm really hoping, I, I think the next 18 months will be pretty transformational for the Nocode space and Bubble in particular. I think we have an opportunity to really turn this movement, which is an early adopter movement so far, into what I, I really think a household name uh, that will keep having the impact that I just mentioned with you know this uh, little portal for pregnant women. Uh, and I'm very really looking forward to do that together with everyone. Cool, well, no, no. Thank you much for joining us. It's been a pleasure speaking to you, man. It's great uh, being here.
Yeah, cool. Until thank next you. time. Bye. Bye. Um, and thank you all of you guys for joining us again for No Code Week Founder Stories. That was Emmanuel Strachanov from Bubble. I want to remind you guys that we offer a $2,000 uh, discount off through, for Bubble through Startup Starter through our partnership. So if you haven't joined, please join us on Startup Starter. We're a smart community for startups, investors, and service providers doing big things. Thank you for joining us again, and we'll see you soon. Stay tuned for tomorrow, our networking session. And then next week, we have Typeform, Airtable, Software, and a bunch of other really good companies. So we'll see you then. Ciao.